And God bless you all in this day. And I think all of you, I'm sure, are very happy and joyful. I can still hear you. I probably can hear you from where you are. I know you are happy and joyful because, once again, we are here in our Thursday meeting to meditate on our Lord and meditate on that very beautiful doctrine that God is giving us in His Word. When we read the Bible, we find spiritual riches. And so this is a great treasure. The Bible is a treasure. And we must read the Bible, for it is a hidden treasure. And so I invite you to read the Bible for God. He works miracles, and God manifests himself constantly in people's lives, working healings, wonders, just like God did from the very beginning when he did so in the apostolic time, today God is manifesting himself with us. And so he continues to be the same yesterday, today, and forevermore. All his marvels, his power and manifestation, and the love and the mercy that he has for human beings. And so we give the honor and glory to our God. And we are going to, of course, before we begin our reading, today we're going to be reading a lot of the Bible. So I do advise you to have your Bibles ready to read some verses that we will be reading today. And we will be singing hymn 209 in your hymnal books, hymn 209, titled, No One Ever Cared For Me Like Jesus. And, well, this is the reality. This is the truth. No one could ever have cared for us more than our Lord Jesus Christ, who gave his life for us. And so we will be singing this hymn to honor our God. Yo quisiera hablarte del amor de Cristo, pues en él hay un amigo fuerte y fiel. Por su gracia transformó mi vida entera. Lo que en esta vida soy lo debo a él. No. Estaba llena de ayes y tristezas, llena estaba de miserias y dolor. Con ternura Cristo me tendió la mano y me guió por el sendero del amor. No. Corazón infunde dulce paz. No comprenderé por qué vino a salvarme hasta que en el cielo pueda ver su faz. Nadie pudo amarme como Cristo. Es incomparable su amistad. Solo él pudo redimirme del pecado. Por su amor y su bondad. Glory to our Lord. And we give our Lord thanks for his mercy, for his love for his promises, 
and his word that he fulfills each day. And today we will be reflecting and meditating upon something which is the circumcision. I think that there are very few people who don't go to the church who have not had the opportunity to go to the church and had had that word or who heard the word circumcision. In the Bible, it is an order, a law that God gave to Moses. And that circumcision God gave to Moses in that time, it had a meaning. It had symbolism for the future. And that is what we're going to observe. And we will also be learning if this circumcision should be realized today or if it has been annulled and removed physically. This is what we're going to learn, the true circumcision and what that meant, what was the meaning of the circumcision, what was the objective or the purpose with which God ordered Abraham to be circumcised, he and his family, his home. So this is something very interesting. And also for today, for us to do God's will because we are seeking the true path. We want to follow righteousness and follow the right path. And we must do many things God ordered in the Bible, but there are also many things that have been annulled. They were removed. They are on the cross of Calvary. And this is what we're learning. What was that our Lord Jesus Christ removed on that cross of Calvary? And what is this new life that he is offering? What is this new covenant that he made with the Father? And this covenant is his gospel. And what is it that we need to do today or practice? And everything else also, of course, is in the heart and is left in history, that part, that side. But it is important for us to read that we review and go over and be informed of everything that occurred, of all of the ordinances and all the laws God gave, and which are fulfilled, which need to be practiced today, which are no longer practiced because the Lord has already done so for us. And so very well, true circumcision, the true circumcision, what does the true circumcision consist of? Well, let us first read in Genesis so that we may then discuss what that circumcision consisted of. And in Genesis chapter 17, we will be opening our Bibles quickly. Genesis chapter 17. And with your Bibles, go ahead and search. Verse 10 to 14. Here in chapter 17, God had appeared before Abraham and made a promise. He told him he would be the father of many nations, that he would bless him and his family, his descendants, and his seed. And, well, the seed that the Lord spoke to him that would be blessed greatly was, of course, in reference to our Lord Jesus Christ. And our Lord made a covenant with Abraham. And so that covenant was in reference to the following in verse 10. The Lord told Abraham, Now when the Lord appeared before Abraham, the law of Moses was still not present. There was no law in that time. Every man, every woman did what they saw fit praising idols, believing in any other god because they were seeking to worship a god and they turned away from God and began their idolatry. That idolatry began from the time of Adam and Eve. And after the great flood, idolatry continued. Now when God found Abraham and made a calling to him, now Abraham's parents, his family, they were idolaters. Abraham himself surely perhaps had practiced idolatry because his family, his ancestors, they were idolaters. 
But God, when he made the calling to Abraham, God taught him. God taught him, and also God saw in Abraham a heart that was willing for him. And this is why God chose him to be the father of faith, to be the father of many nations, to be the father of the church, the church of our Lord Jesus, that the church comes from faith, from hearing the gospel and the word of our Lord. So this is what happened to Abraham. He was the first who had faith when he heard the word of our Lord. And God spoke to Abraham, and when he made him this promise, he made a covenant with him. And in verse 10, it says, This is my covenant, which you shall keep between me and you and your descendants after you. Every male child among you shall be circumcised. And so this was the covenant he made with him that all male child would be circumcised. Now, this does not say that the females would be circumcised. Only the male children would be circumcised. Now, it says, you shall, verse 11, you shall be circumcised in the flesh of your foreskins, and it shall be a sign of the covenant between me and you. So, the circumcision consisted of a small surgery on the male member. And it's said that this would be a sign of the covenant between God and Abraham's descendants. Now, Abraham's offspring or his descendants is the church of our Lord as well. And so we might ask ourselves then, well, what about the circumcision? Well, this is what we're going to learn today. And so... Now you know what the circumcision is about. It is a small sur surgery performed on the male children, on their male member. Now it says, He who is eight days old among you shall be circumcised. Every male child in your generations, he who is born in your house or bought with money from any foreigner who is not your descendant. He who is born in your house and he who is bought with your money must be circumcised. And my covenant shall be in your flesh for an everlasting covenant. So you see, this covenant would be with the men and women or with Abraham's descendants. It would be an everlasting covenant. So when it says everlasting covenant, well, that's forever. But further on, we will discover if truly we are keeping this commandment. Verse 14. And the uncircumcised male child who is not circumcised in the flesh of his foreskin, that person shall be cut off from his people. He has broken my covenant. And so, this was the order God gave Abraham. This was the covenant God made with Abraham to solidify that he would be the father of many nations, of many people. He would be the father of faith. Today, we can say that we are children of Abraham. He's our father by faith. For today, we've heard the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ we have heard the word of God when he spoke to us through prophecy, visions, and dreams. And we've believed. Faith began to be born and grow in our life. This is why we say we are children of Abraham, our father. He is the father of faith. And we are discussing the true circumcision. Or... At least, the circumcision, is it physical or is it spiritual? Now, what we are reading of is a physical circumcision. Now, here in Deuteronomy, Deuteronomy, you find Genesis, and then after that, you'll find Exodus, Leviticus, and then Deuteronomy. Deuteronomy chapter 10, verse 16. Now, Moses 
Moses is reminding the people of Israel in the wilderness. Now let us remember, Moses was with the people of Israel 40 years in the wilderness. And through those, throughout those 40 years, he gave the law of Moses to Moses and he told them to write them down in a book. And when Moses was about to die, he once again gathered the Israelites, those who had left Egypt, they had all died in the wilderness, and the new generation was who was left and who then passed on to the land of Canaan. And so to them, those who those were who Moses gathered and reminded them of the law of Moses, the commandments of the Lord. He once again told them everything that they ought to keep word for word to a T, all the commandments of the Lord in order to live, in order to have eternal life, in order to walk with God. They needed to keep the commandments. And so in this chapter 10, Chapter 10, once again, he reminds them and tells them in verse 16, Therefore circumcise the foreskin of your heart and be stiff-necked no longer. Now, Moses knew that because of the law, God had already given Moses the law, and in the law he had taught them that they needed to be circumcised. All male child who was eight days born, they already knew that they, at that point, had all been circumcised. But Moses tells them, Moses tells them, aside from that physical circumcision, aside from that small surgery, you need to circumcise the foreskin of your heart and be stiff-necked no longer. He was trying to imply that they should not be rebellious or unbelieving to God's word and God's command, that they ought to keep and obey and submit to the will of God and com com complete his commandments. And here he spoke of a circumcision that was spiritual, knowing, Moses knowing that at that point they had all been physically circumcised. But he was telling them the most important thing is the circumcision of the heart. Not so much the physical, but the heart. Be humble, obedient, submissive, and fearful of God. Please, God, obey him. Set aside all rebelliousness and hardness of heart, stubbornness. Don't be materialistic. This is what Moses said to them. And so he said again, circumcise your heart. We continue reading here in Joshua. Following Deuteronomy then follows Joshua. He was who succeeded Moses. Moses died in the wilderness. And Joshua succeeded him. Here in chapter 5 of Joshua... He was now with the people of Israel, and they had entered the land of Canaan. And Joshua, he also began to read the law of God, the law of Moses. He began to read to the people and to teach them that they should not forget. They should not forget the word of our Lord. That they should not forget the scriptures that had been left written in that book, that they ought to keep mind, be mindful of them and fulfill them. Now in chapter 5, verse 2, it says, At that time the Lord said to Joshua, Make flint knives for yourself and circumcise the sons of Israel again the second time. For the first circumcision it had been done in the wilderness by the hand of Moses. Although Abraham, he had been circumcised with all of his family, all of his household, his servants, and all of the people who were there. And from there on out, Isaac, he too, and Jacob, Esau, all of them were circumcised. But as they then had to go and live in Egypt, and in Egypt they spent 430 years they were not circumcised while they were there. 
Throughout those 430 years, they did not circumcise themselves because they did not keep the commandments of the Lord because they were slaves. In Egypt, they were slaves to the king of Egypt, and he had them submitted under his control and did not give them the freedom to glorify, praise, or keep none of the commandments that God had ordered. This is why the Lord used Moses to free them from Egypt, and he led them to the wilderness. And so here, when they enter the land of Canaan by the hand of Joshua, the Lord reveals to Joshua and he tells him that he needs to make flint knives and once again circumcise the sons of Israel again a second time. Now it says Joshua did as he was instructed. He made the flint knives for himself and circumcised the sons of Israel at the hill of the foreskins. Now this was the order regarding the circumcision. And let us remember the circumcision was the covenant God had made with Abraham, saying to him that he would be the father of many nations. And why are we interested in learning about the circumcision? Well, we are the generations that, or the generations that are present and that come from the loins, in the spiritual sense, come from the loins of Abraham. We are children of Abraham by faith because we believed in the Lord. And we continue forward in Jeremiah. Let us now move on to Jeremiah. Now it's many books ahead. It's almost about in the middle of the Bible. You'll find Psalm, Isaiah, and then Jeremiah. Jeremiah chapter 4. Jeremiah chapter 4. Reading regarding this very important topic. And at the end, you'll see how important it is. Jeremiah chapter 4, verse 4. Now we here are many centuries ahead and after Joshua's time, many centuries when God used his prophets so that they could carry the prophetic word to the people of Israel and to the principalities and governors of the time, to the kings. And they... They would bring the word, they would preach and prophesy, though they were not heard. They were despised, the prophets were. But the Lord said to the prophets to keep, to keep and fulfill their duty, to speak and to prophesy and to teach. For that, everything else, if they didn't listen, that would be their problem. And God, he would be the one in charge of judging, blessing, or punishing those who did not want to hear his commands and fulfill them. And in verse 4, chapter 4, the Lord was sending a message to the Israelites, a message of repentance, that they ought to repent for they were sinning. And every day their sin was growing. It was so great and grave, the sins they were committing before the Lord, that the Lord was very angry. He had already determined, made the decision to destroy the people of Israel, to destroy them all to destroy Judah and Jerusalem. But nevertheless, the Lord tells Jeremiah, go and speak to them again to see if they'll repent. Verse 4, he's, verse, chapter 4, verse 4, circumcise yourselves to the Lord and take away the foreskins of your hearts, you men of Judah and inhabitants of Jerusalem, lest my fury come forth like fire and burn so that no one can quench it because of the evil of your doings. The Lord, very angry, was saying that his fury, God was furious. He was wrathful, and who would be able to quench it? The Lord said he was going to be punishing their evil doings, and he told them to circumcise themselves, but to circumcise their heart. For we see that they... They had kept the order, the physical, material order of performing the physical circumcision. Well, for them, they thought it was something easy to obey that physical part. Very easy to do. But the Lord here was also speaking to them and saying that this circumcision was also accompanied with good works, with what is in the heart of man or woman. And so those two circumcisions needed to be performed, that of the heart, which is to take away sin, to take away or abandon idolatry and greed, 
thefts, cons, deceits, lies, pride, and how they would humiliate the weak, adultery, fornication, and murders, homicides, all of these types of sins. The Lord wanted them to remove and abandon all of that. And this is why he spoke through the prophet that they ought to circumcise their hearts, to circumcise the foreskin of their hearts. For from the heart comes the good and the bad. It comes from the heart. Good works and bad works, they come from the heart. Whoever has a good heart, well, good works come from it. They are giving, they are upright, they're merciful, they are holy, they're upright. They do good things, they love God, they love their neighbor. They're generous. But someone who has a bad heart, while well, their works are bad and sin is ruling. And this is what happened to the people of Israel. They had performed the physical circumcision, and they believed that with that, it was enough. And God said, no, you need to also circumcise the foreskin of your heart. It is not valid, the physical part that you're doing. Stop sinning. Stop doing evil things. Do good works. That is the circumcision. So the circumcision had that meaning. And here in Acts, now we're going to go to the New Testament. For here, in the Old Testament, we find that the people of Israel, they, they kept with the physical law of the circumcision. And they thought that with having performed the physical circumcision, it was enough but they lived in sin. But our Lord said, this is not so. And so when we, when we move on to the New Testament, where it narrates to us the doctrine of the true gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ, and it narrates to us that our Lord Jesus Christ, he performed his sacrifice. He gave his life on the cross of Calvary and he shed his blood for the remission of sins. And also to annul, to abolish the physical law of Moses. To annul and abolish the circumcision. To remove all the physical. For the physical was not useful. It did not help people to be saved. It did not help people to earn eternal life. It did not help. None of the physical things of the law of Moses helped. Now, our Lord did say in his word, I no longer want blood of male goats or of sheep or bulls. I don't need the blood of animals. I no longer want those animal sacrifices. What I want is a living sacrifice. I want a contrite, humble heart that does the will of God, that does the will of the Father. This is what I want. And this is why our Lord Jesus Christ needed to come and fulfill all of the law of Moses, fulfill it to a T, so that he could then annul and remove that physical law. The physical law, which was called the law of the word. There is a verse in the Bible that says the word kills, but the spirit gives life. And so meaning the word was the physical law of Moses. And it killed, yes, because no one kept it. No one was able to fulfill the law to a T. So it killed the spiritual life of men and women of the people of Israel. It killed them in their spiritual life. They were all dead, spiritually speaking. So this is why the word kills. The law of Moses, the physical law, kills. But the Spirit gives life, referring to the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ. The gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ is the Spirit of God moving himself in the hearts of men and women that convert truly to God. That is the Spirit. The Spirit brings to life 
the Spirit of God, the Spirit of God manifesting himself in men and women, transforming them, changing them, so that they fulfill the commandments of the Lord, so that they no longer sin. And so now we'll go to Acts, where our Lord Jesus Christ is now reigning. Our Lord is reigning with his gospel, and he has his followers. Now in Acts, our Lord Jesus Christ had already performed his sacrifice on the cross, and he had annulled the law of Moses, physical. Because, of course, the law, it had its symbolism and meaning that was spiritual, and that spiritual meaning of the law of Moses is what we are living and practicing today. But it is spiritually. Now, the spiritual was very evident that when the Samaritan woman said to our Lord Jesus Christ, she said, Lord, where is it that we ought to worship? Our fathers say that we must worship here in the, in the temple of Jerusalem. And those of Samaria say that it is in Samaria, in the temple that is there where God should be praised. I don't understand where we should praise the Lord. So the Lord Jesus Christ says to her, Woman, the day is coming that neither here in Jerusalem, in the temple, nor in Samaria, not in that temple that is there either, you will not worship God there because God is spirit. And God is seeking worshipers to worship him in spirit and in truth. And so our Lord Jesus taught this to the Samaritan woman because he knew that when he was going to go to the cross and die and shed his blood and be sacrificed for all of us, he would annul the law of Moses. And among the law of Moses, let us remember, was the temple. In the time of antiquity, the tabernacle that Moses built, and then later it was the temple when Solomon created and built the first temple. And so that was annulled. So not in that temple, nor, not in that physical place do you worship God, but it is in spirit and in truth because he is spirit. And so the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ is in spirit. Just as the kingdom, we went over that, that the kingdom of our Lord is spiritual, it is not physical. And so on the cross of Calvary, our Lord Jesus Christ carried out that great work of annulling and abolishing the physical law of Moses. Because the spiritual, the symbolic, the figures, and the shadow of everything continues to be valid in our lives and in the followers of Christ and the followers of the gospel. It continues to be valid, those laws, but now in the spiritual sense. And so in Acts chapter 15, here in Acts chapter 15, there is... Some a small a short story. There's a short story here in Acts, and it was the life of the first Christians, the life of when the apostles first began to preach the gospel, and had some experiences. Some of the things that happened, they were left written here in Acts. Now, very little of it, but what was important is here, here in. Acts chapter 15, verse 1, And certain men came down from Judea and taught the brethren, Unless you are circumcised according to the custom of Moses, you cannot be saved. Now, they were teaching this, some who had already believed in the gospel of Christ. Verse 2, Therefore, when Paul and Barnabas had no small dissension and dispute with them, they determined that Paul and Barnabas and certain others of them should go up to Jerusalem to the apostles and elders about this question. So, being sent on their way by the church, they passed through Phoenicia and Samaria, describing the conversation of the Gentiles. So now at this point, they were shocked that the Gentiles, who were the foreigners who did not belong to the people of Israel, to the Jews, but they were foreigners of other nations, and they were called Gentiles. It says that they had, some of them, and the majority had converted to Jesus Christ and were enjoying the spiritual gifts and the gospel of the Lord. Now the apostles, as Jews, they were shocked 
with this phenomenon. They thought, well, the Gentiles as well, just like they, they were receiving God's blessings. But they would discuss among themselves, and here in verse 4, and it says, And when they had come to Jerusalem, they were received by the church and the apostles and the elders, and they reported all things that God had done with them. But some of the sect of the Pharisees who believed rose up saying, Now let us notice there was a group of Pharisees here who had believed in the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ. But it says here, saying, It is necessary to circumcise them and to command them to keep the law of Moses. This is what the Pharisees, who had converted to the gospel, had said. They said, You must circumcise them and tell them to keep the law of Moses. Verse 6 says, Now the apostles and elders came together to consider this matter. And when there had been much dispute, Peter rose up and said to them, Men and brethren, you know that a good while ago God chose among us that by my mouth the Gentiles should hear the word of the gospel and believe. So God, who knows the heart, acknowledged them by giving them the Holy Spirit, just as he did to us, and made no distinction between us and them, meaning... We, the Jews, we were Jews, and they were Gentiles. They were foreigners. And he gave them the Holy Spirit. And he made no distinction between us, but he purified them. He says he purifying their hearts by faith. Now, therefore, why do you test God? By putting a yoke on the neck of the disciples, which neither our fathers nor we are able to bear? So they were saying, how is it possible that we test God and these people, these Gentiles, how will we place a yoke upon them, a burden that not even our fathers nor us the Jews have been able to bear? This is the sincerity saying no one had kept the law of Moses, all of the rituals that Moses had taught. It says, but we believe that through the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ, we shall be saved in the same manner as they. And it is the only way that they did not allow them to be circumcised. For at that point, they were saying here that the Holy Spirit was manifesting itself and the Holy Spirit was giving the spiritual gifts, and they were already speaking in tongues and working the spiritual gifts. So how was it possible that they should be forced to be circumcised when this had been a ritual or something from the time of antiquity, and no one had been able to fulfill nor keep, not even themselves? So how would they place burdens upon these people who were now converted to the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ? So the apostles... They forbid it, and they said, this should not be. The circumcision, it should come to an end. And it did have an end. It was on the cross of Calvary. But here in the life of the first Christians, they wanted to force the Gentiles to be circumcised. Now, in some parts, it says to avoid being killed in a certain place, they would circumcise them, but they knew that, of course, the physical circumcision, this ritual, did not need to be performed. Because this ritual, this circumcision, it had become spiritual. It had become spiritual. We continue in Romans after Acts is the book of Romans, chapter 4. Romans chapter 4. Verse 11 and 12. Here in Romans chapter 4, Apostle Paul is speaking or he sent an epistle or a letter to the believers in Jesus Christ who lived in Rome in that time. He sent a letter full of doctrine. It was pure of doctrine, and that's all he taught. For they too would ask Apostle Paul what would happen with the circumcision, what needed to be done. So the apostle taught them in verse 11. Paul, 
he begins to tell the story of Abraham and that Abraham was justified by faith, that he was not justified by the law, but it was by faith because he had believed God and that this is why God had made this covenant with him and had said that he would be the father of many nations. And this is why Abraham is called or it was accounted to him as righteousness, the way he behaved and believed in God and did God's will. And so Paul explains to them regarding Abraham, and he then says how his faith was accounted as righteousness. How was it? Well, and he received that righteousness, the sign of circumcision. So how was it that God told Abraham, you are a righteous man? You are a man of faith. That if Abraham was now in the law of Moses, or was it before the law of Moses? He was saying it was before the law of Moses that Abraham spoke with God and God made him these marvelous promises. And so the question was, when God said all of this to Abraham, he was in the circumcision or was he in the uncircumcision? So he gives an answer and he says, he received the sign of the circumcision. So he was in the sign of verse 10. He was uncircumcised here. This is where we're reading in verse 10. He was a person who still did not have the law of God because the law came later on. So the apostle asked them, you, you're stubborn because it seems that there were several groups of Jews who had converted to the gospel and they wanted to circumcise themselves and they wanted others to be circumcised. This is why the apostle, he says, well, look at what happened to Abraham. He received that order from God being uncircumcised. And God told him to be circumcised. And then comes the law. But what he wanted to do was give the Jews an explanation. They were those who were insisting upon the circumcision for all. Now in verse 11, Paul teaches the church in Rome, and he says, and he receives the sign of circumcision, a seal of the righteousness of the faith, which he had while still uncircumcised, that he might be the father of all those who believe, though they are, though they are uncircumcised, that righteousness might be imputed to them also. Now this verse is trying to say that Abraham received the circumcision as a sign and as a seal of righteousness, meaning God, he accounted him as righteous. And those who follow after Abraham, they are righteous too. We are righteous by faith in our Lord Jesus Christ. We are righteous. So God calls us righteous. He accounts you a holy man, a holy woman, because you are set apart for me, because you have believed in me. And so the Lord begins to do the work and that miracle in our lives, in our hearts. And he takes away our sinning tendency. When he takes away that sinning tendency, as God did so with Abraham and with his descendants of taking away the sinning tendency, which is in the heart, the Lord then says, you are righteous. You are a righteous woman. You are a righteous man. You practice righteousness because your circumcision is in the heart. Because you have turned away from sin. Because I've transformed you. When you believed in me, I transformed you. And I took away that sinning tendency. And now you are righteous. You are a righteous person who does the will of God. This is what happened to Abraham, and that also happens to his descendants. And we, we are accounted, or we are counted as the descendants of Abraham. And Apostle Paul wanted to explain that to the Jews who had converted to the gospel, but they didn't want to understand. They were completely, completely stuck on their ritual. And it says that for all of them, that faith that Abraham had, and the faith we have, have had in the Lord, it is then accounted to us as righteousness. And so the Lord has circumcised our heart. Verse 12, it says, Abraham was the father of circumcision to those who not only are of the circumcision, meaning the father of the Jews, 
father, not just of those who are Jews, it says here, but who is also father of those who walk in the, of also, he's also the father of the Gentiles. And it says, but he, who also walk in the steps of faith, which our father Abraham had while still uncircumcised. So our father Abraham, father of circumcision and uncircumcision. He's the father of Gentiles and of Jews. But those Jews who convert to the gospel of Jesus Christ and follow the gospel, not that they will continue to follow the law of Moses because the law of Moses was abolished on the cross because no one was able to fulfill it. Everything was physical and material. No one was able to fulfill it. The Lord had to fulfill it himself to remove it on the cross. And then he could begin that new life in beings or that new method of salvation so that people could be saved believing in Christ. And after believing in Christ, what does he do? He sends his Holy Spirit and allows the Spirit of God to begin to live in our hearts so that it transforms us and takes away our sins. It takes away our stains and the appetite of our flesh. It takes away the appetite of committing adultery, fornication, or of stealing, or of committing kidnaps, or homicides or being grudgeful or negative he takes away that appetite that we had in our past or in our heart that is the circumcision the spiritual circumcision and so when the lord told abraham that the circumcision would be an everlasting covenant yes first it was physical and when jesus christ abolished everything that was physical on the cross of calvary then the spiritual continued so today Every man, every woman that converts to the true gospel of Jesus Christ, they are circumcised. God circumcises them. And how is that? He takes away the sinning appetite that is in their heart. He takes it away. And that person begins to live a new life upright before the Lord. A life of pleasing God. A life without sin. That is is the circumcision. And this is what the Lord spoke through the prophets. And he said to the people, circumcise the foreskin of your heart. Do good works. We continue here in 1st of Corinthians. After Romans. After Romans is Corinthians. 1st of Corinthians. 1st Corinthians chapter 7. 1st Corinthians chapter 7. In verse 19. And it says. In Corinthians. Apostle Paul continues to teach the church in Corinth. First Corinthians chapter 7 verse 19. It says circumcision. Well. The apostle. Is saying that. All men, all women that come to the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ, in whatever state they arrive, that they should remain in, that God, he would begin to give a solution to their life. He will resolve their life, however the current state of it is. And so in this chapter, the apostle was saying, well, you arrived alone, well, then be alone. You arrived with a wife, well, then stay with your wife. If you arrive separated, divorced, well, then remain as you are. But either way, remain as you are, for he will bring a solution to your life. And so, in verse 18, was anyone called while circumcised? Meaning that if you had been circumcised and now you know the gospel of the Lord, he says, remain as you are, circumcised, remain as such. But let him not, well, if you arrived uncircumcised, will then remain as is, because in in the gospel of our Lord, he is the only one that changes and transforms lives and makes men and women however he wants them. So it says, verse 18, was anyone called while circumcised? Let him not become uncircumcised. Was anyone called while uncircumcised? Let him not be circumcised. So don't be circumcised. Remain as you are. 19, circumcision is nothing. The physical circumcision. Circumcision is nothing. The physical circumcision is nothing. And uncircumcision is nothing. So, not the one thing or the other. It meant nothing. Physically. It no longer had any value. Because no one was able to keep any of the physical 
laws of Moses. The law of Moses was physical and material. No one was able to keep it. it says circumcision is nothing and uncircumcision is nothing, but keeping what is important here, but keeping the commandments of God is what matters. This is what matters. Keeping the commandments of God. And so, if a Jew comes who was circumcised, don't worry. If a Gentile comes who is uncircumcised, don't worry. For God is the one who will be in charge of circumcising your heart. And think that you will have a new life. A life that is pleasing to God. Because now you will no longer sin. Because God will take away that sinning appetite. And we continue in Colossians. Further ahead of, Colo of Corinthians. You'll find Galatians, Ephesians. And then Colossians. Colossians chapter 2. Colossians chapter 2. They are very short books. Colossians chapter 2, verse 11. Apostle Paul also here teaching the church in Colossia. They also asked many questions to the apostle regarding the circumcision. Now, the topic of the circumcision was very controversial in 2.11. And the apostle teaches he says, Jesus Christ, he says, in him, or verse 8, Beware lest anyone cheat you through philosophy and empty deceit, according to the tradition of men, according to the basic principles of the world, and not according to Christ. For in him dwells all the fullness of God, of the Godhead body, bodily. And you are complete in him. Who, so it says again, you are complete in him, you are whole in the Lord. Who is the head? Jesus Christ is the head of all principality and power. In him, meaning Jesus Christ, verse 11, in him, Jesus Christ, you were also circumcised with the circumcision made without hands, meaning there was no need to perform that small surgery by putting off the body of the sins of the flesh by the circumcision of Christ. And so Jesus Christ was who circumcises. He is the one that circumcised all of them. And the circumcision is now in the heart without performing any physical surgery. This is the true circumcision. This is what today we have. And now we're going to go over to Philippians. Philippians it is before Thessalonians, right? Philippians is before Thessalonians. Philippians chapter 3, verse 3, speaking of the true circumcision. Now for a many, the word is unknown, but don't worry about it. As I have invited you to read the Bible, when you are reading the Bible, you will find these words and you may not understand, but now at least you'll understand what this is about and you'll understand things better. Sir, uh, Philippians chapter 3, verse 3, Apostle Paul also here, now speaking to the church in Philippi. Now here, the Apostle tells the Philippians, he tells Timothy, who was there he tells them to beware, for there were many Jews who wanted to circumcise the believers, the followers of Christ. And the apostle says in verse 2, beware of dogs. Now, this was in reference to people that were behaving like dogs, ravaged dogs. It says, beware of dogs, beware of evil workers, beware of the mutilation, meaning those who were performing the circumcision mutilation or the mutilators, those performing the surgery, saying you don't need to do this anymore because Jesus Christ has annulled it on the cross of Calvary. You don't need to perform this small surgery. So they would call them mutilators. Verse 3, For we are the circumcision who worship God in the Spirit, rejoice in Christ Jesus, and have no confidence in the flesh having no confidence, meaning in the works of the law of Moses. That is what the flesh means. 
So, we are the circumcision, meaning the believers in Jesus Christ. We are those who in spirit serve the Lord. We glory in Christ. This, this is the true circumcision. Now, let us go to Galatians. Galatians, which is behind, it is back before Galatians. Galatians chapter 5. Galatians chapter 5. Verse 1 through 6, we're going to read very quickly. Galatians chapter 5, 1 through 6. Apostle Paul writes to the Galatians and continues to teach them regarding the topic of the circumcision. And he says, Stand fast, therefore, in the liberty by which Christ has made us free, and do not be entangled again with a yoke of bondage, meaning the law of Moses. Indeed, I, Paul, say to you that if you become circumcised, Christ will profit you nothing. And I testify again to every man who becomes circumcised that he is a debtor to keep the whole law, the law of Moses, me meaning you can't miss a single comma, a single period. You need to fulfill all of it. If not, well, then you become a breaker of the law, and therefore you will be condemned for it. So he says, if you are circumcised, then you need to keep all of the law. So it is better that you don't do that, is what Apostle Paul said. He says, you have become estranged from Christ. Again, you have become estranged from Christ, from the law of Moses, you who attempt to be justified by law, you have fallen from grace. So, if you begin to teach the believers in Christ that they need to be circumcised, well then, what Christ has done is then, it means nothing. You have fallen from grace. You've lost the grace of God. You've lost salvation, the free salvation God was offering or has offered. It says, for we... Through the Spirit, through the Holy Spirit of God, eagerly wait for the hope of righteousness by faith. For in Christ Jesus, and I hope that you are reading at home as well, and I, I want you to read along with me. For in Christ Jesus, neither circumcision nor uncircumcision avails anything but faith working through love. Faith is believing in the gospel of Jesus Christ and it works through love, which means not to practice sin. So it says, in Christ Jesus, circumcision and uncircumcision means nothing. Now we are meditating upon what the true circumcision is. Now we'll go over to Romans chapter 2. Romans chapter 2. It is behind Corinthians, Romans chapter 2, now to finish, we'll be reading in verse 25. Verse 25, now again, it is with the same letter that Apostle Paul wrote to the church in Rome. He says, for circumcision is indeed profitable. So circumcision is indeed profitable if you keep the law of Moses fully, meaning you complete it, you keep it all of it. You don't miss a single tittle or a single comma of the law that isn't fulfilled. But if you are a breaker of the law, meaning that you don't keep a commandment as little as it might be, your circumcision has become uncircumcision. So you become uncircumcised because you are not keeping the entire law of Moses. And do not forget, there are very small commandments God gave in such a way that God compared it to a comma and a tittle. Now, how small they were, but if they happen to be missing from the law of Moses, if it's not fulfilled, well then, it is of no use. All is vain, and you are in nothing. You've lost eternal life. You've lost salvation. And so the apostle again tells them, yes, circumcision is indeed profitable if you keep all of the laws of the law of Moses. And if not, 
Well, then everything is null. Verse 26 says, Therefore, if an uncircumcised man keeps the righteous requirements of the law of Moses, will not his circumcision be counted as circumcision? The apostle was trying to say that if a Gentile, who had not been a Jew ever in his life, but a Gentile of any other nation, and if he fulfills all of the law of Moses to a T, word for word, without missing a comma, a period, God immediately said that he was circumcised. Even without having performed the physical circumcision, the physical surgery, with the simple fact that this man, who comes from another nation, not of the Jews, and keeps all of the law of Moses, so God would be pleased with that and would say, you are circumcised. Because your heart is circumcised, because you have kept all of the law, all of my word. And so this was an example that the apostle gave, because truly, well, that never happened with anyone, because no one, everyone broke the law. And God looked at the world to see if there was one who did God's will, and he said that there was not a single one who had done God's will. And so... They were all uncircumcised, though they had been physically circumcised. Verse 27. And will not the physically uncircumcised, if he fulfills the law, judge you who, even with your written code and circumcision, are a transgressor of the law of Moses? For he is not a Jew who is one outwardly, nor is circumcision that which is outward in the flesh. But he is a Jew who is one inwardly in the heart, meaning in the circumcision is of the heart, and in the spirit, not in the letter, whose praise is not from men, but from God. This is the conclusion. The true spiritual Jew is the person that does and keeps the word of God and carries the circumcision in their heart. Fulfilling all of the laws of God, the commandments of God, not sinning. So this person does not sin and keeps the commandments, loves their neighbor. They are generous. They are merciful. They help those in need. They don't hold grudges, hatred. They have no pride. They don't belittle anyone. They are not an adulterer or fornicator. They don't steal or take away from those who have nothing. They don't steal. They don't lie. And so that man, it says that his circumcision is of the heart. That is the true circumcision because it is in spirit. And it is doing God's will. It is keeping God's commandments. And so, this is the true circumcision. For our Lord Jesus Christ, He did the work. He did that great job on the cross of Calvary. He lived and kept all of the law of Moses. He was physically circumcised. And He kept all of the law. And there on the cross of Calvary, He left it all there to begin a new life in human beings, in men and women, that from there on out, all men and women who would, be, who would be believing in him and trusting in him, he would then be the one to circumcise each person so that men and women would not commit sin and keep the commandments of the Lord and keep that true circumcision of the heart and spirit as Verse 29 says, For it is in the inward heart, it is in the heart, it is in the spirit, it's not physical. And so I hope, I hope that this topic of the circumcision you've understood and comprehended and you are not confused, and that no one should come and force you or say to you that you are not well in the eyes of God for you are not circumcised. But you... Follow the path of the true gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ. The gospel of our Lord, the kingdom of our God, is spiritual. 
and the temple of our God, that tabernacle of the time of antiquity, it is spiritual. The heart of a man or a woman that does not commit sin, it is a temple of God. It is a tabernacle of God. God is building a structure. God is building a, a temple, a church. He is building it. It is a spiritual church. And it is made up of hearts of men and women of many nations. Made up of all of them. He raises up his building, his church, so that God may dwell. God may be honored and glorified. This is why men and women, those that are knowledgeable of the gospel of our Lord, we must praise and glorify him all the time, continuously, and to turn away from all evil and sin because we are the temple of our God. So he deserves the honor, the glory, the praise. And so the work of our Lord, he is doing that marvelous work. This is why our Lord Jesus Christ said that there was no temple in a specific place to worship God. But the worshipers would worship him in spirit and truth. So our God is the one in charge. Our Lord Jesus Christ, as the head of the church, he is forming that glorious body, that temple, that glorious spiritual tabernacle that is holy, made up of men and women of many nations. And in this way, the promise of our God is fulfilled, the promise that he made to Abraham when he said you would be the father of many nations. There that promise is fulfilled. And so we give the honor and the glory to our God. And we are now going to be praying and asking the Lord for mercy. And asking the Lord to manifest himself with miracles and wonders and deeds and signs in the life of each of you. And so each of you must present your petition, your prayer before the Lord. For you write to me. You write and say that I have a person who is suffering of schizophrenia, another who has epileptic attacks, others who watch pornography, others who are drug addicts, another person who their families, their, their marriage, their husband abandons them or the wife abandons them, someone who's not keeping up with their responsibilities, others that are sick and hospitalized, the children that are sick, and children also who that are in the wombs of their mothers who are also Having, who have illnesses, and we've prayed, and I know the Lord has worked many miracles in regards to that, but there are many needs, there are many petitions that you have, and your afflictions that you live, the witchcraft and sorcery that you are tormented with, people tormented by evil spirits, curses, and so you, in the moment in which we are praying, Raise your hands if you want, or place your hand upon your heart and cry out to the Lord and say to him, ask him for mercy. And so, although maybe you have not had the chance to go to the church, trust and believe God will hear you, listen to you, and will have mercy of you. And also, I invite you to read the Bible. It is very important to read the Bible. And so, we will be praying to the Lord in this moment. We're going to give God thanks. Oh, blessed Heavenly Father, Thank you, Lord. Thank you for your love and for your mercy. Thank you for listening to us. Thank you for hearing us, for watching over us. Thank you, Lord, for paying attention to us. We who are nothing before you. But, Lord, your love, your mercy, your promises, your plan, your word, everything you fulfill and because of your marvelous, glorious promises that you have made to all of us, you are always attentive to our prayers, to our supplications, our pleas and petitions and needs. Oh, Heavenly Father, you know the affliction, the sadness, the bitterness, and the need of every man, every woman, every child, every elderly person that is suffering with different kinds of evil things that happens. And there's a lot of suffering. But you are the Father, the giver of love and of mercy. And you, Lord, you will raise your mighty hand, and you will help them, and you will bless them, and you will take away those troubles. You will take away the pain and the sadness and the sickness, the physical sicknesses. For there are many people, Lord, that are sick, they all have sicknesses in their skin, in their bones, 
in their circulation, their internal bones, all of their body from their head to their toes, there are people that are suffering. Some are suffering from their feet, their legs. Others suffer and have issues with their head, their fingers, their arms. This is what we hear. We always hear about this and people ask. They ask that we pray to you and ask for mercy and that you heal. People want to be healed. People want to have peace and have health and to rest and to enjoy life. Oh, Holy Father, give a chance to everyone to know you so that when you bless them and when you heal them and you cut away all of these sicknesses and you take away all of these binds and chains and ties from their bodies, that they may recognize you and give you the glory and the honor, that they may praise you, the praise that you deserve, O Heavenly Father. O Lord, give people a chance so that they may understand, so that they may find the path, so that they may believe and also enjoy your presence and your blessings and one day also to enjoy eternal life. O Holy Father, give peace, tranquility to their hearts, and help each person. And there are also many people that are in prison, people that are in prison unjustly. I pray that you have mercy of them, those that are prisoners in jail, and they are innocent. Help them, Lord. Others are in prison because other things, but I pray, Lord, that you have mercy and that you help them so that they may have freedom. May you free each one and bless those that are slaves to the devil. I pray, my Lord, that you extend your hand, that you free, that you break the chains, the ties, and that you take away all the curses of the devil and destroy all evil works. May you bless each man, each woman, every young child or elderly person, anyone who prays to you, may you observe their needs, their petitions, and the desires of their heart. Lord, I pray to you in the glorious name of Jesus Christ, your beloved Son, that you, my Lord, extend your mighty hand. May you act, Holy Father, and may you deliver and bless. Also, Lord, I pray for this plague, for this virus that exists worldwide, that you, my Lord, may remove this plague. Remember us, Lord, and help us. Deliver us and have mercy, Holy Father. Help us, Lord, in the glorious name of Jesus Christ, your beloved Son. To him be all the honor, the glory, and the praise from now and evermore. Amen. Thanks we give to you, Lord. We will be singing this chorus 106, which is titled, Christ is my fortress and my rock. Chorus 106. Cristo es la roca de poder. Escóndeme, escóndeme. Hasta que pase, oh Señor, la tempestad. Escóndeme, escóndeme con tu poder. Cristo es la roca de poder. Él calmará la tempestad. Tú eres Jesús, mi Salvador. Escóndeme. Escóndeme con tu poder, Cristo es la roca de poder, escóndeme, escóndeme, hasta que pase, oh Señor, la tempestad, escóndeme, escóndeme con tu poder. Cristo es la roca de poder, Él calmará la tempestad. Tú eres Jesús, mi Salvador, escóndeme, escóndeme con tu poder. The honor and the glory be for our Lord. Thank you very much. May the Lord bless you greatly. I send you many hugs and many kisses to you all. And I will also be sending special kisses to the children. And for all of you, God bless you. Thank you. Mm -hmm.